Hello students and welcome to my YouTube video to help you prepare for your first test this school year uh, 2019 here at Tazem. Our test is going to be on experimental design, the characteristics of life, and mainly on ecology for our first unit. Uh, real quick uh, tidbit on using these videos, uh, please pause them, please ask yourself questions, please don't just watch it through. If you can explain the material and really engage in explaining phenomena and constructing explanations, then you've got it. Right? and see if you can teach somebody else. So real quick down here, this is just uh, a license that says, I will not make any money off of this clip and others cannot as well. It is solely meant to help you, our students. Um, a lot of the pictures are gonna be from Khan Academy, which is uh, available for free at khanacademy.org. It's a wonderful website full of lots of good practice problems and articles. Uh, then I put some pictures in here, you know, just some ideas, like why are we alive and a stuffed animal isn't in our classroom? Um, what kind of ecosystem is our school? Um, what's going on in our school? And then uh, thinking about Azaba Beach, right? Something near us. Uh, what's going on in the oceans around us? All right, so without further ado, let's jump in. Um, one thing, if you do click around on my YouTube uh, channel, you might find a very similar video to this uh, from last year. Um, no need to watch both. I left it up there. Um, but at this one, I just tried to update with uh, some new things that I went over in class, like the fortune teller fish and some other experiments. Okay, so what makes a good science experiment? How do scientists engage in the nature of science? And so we reviewed that. We did a pogo on it. It would be helpful for you to go back through that pogo. Um, so could you do it with Robert Payne's starfish experiment? What was the independent variable? What was the dependent variable? What were the constants or control variables? What was the control group? Go ahead and pause the video and see if you can talk through it. Hopefully you got something like this. The independent variable is what he manipulated in the experiment. And what he manipulated was he took the starfish out of the ecosystem. So he went to these tidal pools in the Pacific Northwest of the United States. He would take the starfish out and fling them like a Frisbee as far as he could away from the pool. And what was he measuring or what was the responding or dependent variable? It was the number of other species in the pools. So he's really trying to measure what we call biodiversity or how many other species were left. And it was interesting. I asked you to preview it and think about it in class. If you took out this predator that can eat uh, mussels and eat other things, what's going to happen? And the biodiversity started going down. So one year afterwards, there are less species. And another year after it, five years after that, there were only mussels left. All the sea slugs and sea anemones were gone. And it essentially became what's called a monoculture. So what he wrote about and what we learned about in class is that the removal of those starfish really caused an ecological collapse. And those starfish were the independent variable. The dependent variable was the number of species left. And they're called, a, the starfish are called a keystone species, right? If you have an arch and the keystone's in the middle, if you remove the keystone, the whole arch comes crumbling down. Here's a graph just showing the data. And so pretty amazing that over this decade, right, with the starfish around, you have 20 different species in that tidal pool, and you remove it, and it's down to below five. Here's just the keystone species concept. So I put um, links to the video and uh, links to the HHMI uh, work that we did on it in Google Classroom so could you talk about your fortune telling fish experiment, right? That I had you write up on the very first day of school. What was the independent variable there? What was the dependent variable? What were the control variables as well? How would you set up an experiment on bean germination? So we haven't done this yet, but we'll get to it. So we'll grow some beans. What could be the different independent variables that you could test? What would be the dependent variable? And what would you need to keep constant or controlled? And so this is interesting, right? This is, lets us serve as, the control group serves as a standard for comparison. So if we're trying different fertilizers to see uh, how it makes plants grow, the plant with no fertilizer would be a comparison group. And we could compare our results to that group. All right, that's all for experimental design. Um, if uh, any of that was tricky for you, you can come to our review sessions and I'd really encourage you to look at the Pogel and any of your homeworks. So this was a very quick one. We, we used the microscope. We tried to look at some protists and some um, uh, other uh, items that are alive from the palm water that we grew. And what makes them alive? What makes those uh, amoebas alive? And Eugene, our stuffed animal here, not. 
So there's no need to memorize this. You did a little reading article, a little reading article on it, but I, I told you you don't need to memorize any of them. You just need to be able to give an example or put them into context. And so this is why we are alive and say um, water or alcohol or a desk or something else is not. And it's just a helpful tool for us as scientists for when we're uh, talking about the living things in a system. So it would be metabolism, interdependence, evolution, reproduction, heredity, uh, composed of cells from cell theory, and maintaining homeostasis. So on your test or on your assessment, I might just ask you to give me an example of it. So let's go through and see if you can do it. Can you give an example of metabolism? Well, here we're eating a crafty kitchen, right? Whatever you ate, you are breaking down uh, the food. You're breaking it down to give yourself both energy then you're also breaking it down to give yourself uh, chemical nutrients to build more proteins, et cetera. But with metabolism, we're really focused on the energy. And you might remember we talked about in class, the energy currency in our bodies is called adenosine triphosphate. And it's the form of energy that we can use to power uh, cellular reactions. So we can't use glucose or sugar. It's too big. And so we have to break it down. And that's going to be our next unit. And how does your body do that? All right. Can you uh, reproduction? So you should all understand that, right? So we're uh, passing on our genes. So everything that's alive has to have the ability to reproduce. That reproduction could be sexual uh, or it could be asexual. And asexual, the prefix A means without. So that would just be splitting or it could be mitosis or binary fission, et cetera, in a bacteria. And then humans engage in sexual reproduction. We'll learn about uh, the processes of meiosis and mitosis and how uh, different alleles and genes are combined. And it's always pretty fascinating, right? And we can do family trees and follow traits through them. Okay, heredity. So we just talked a little bit about that. Every single living thing alive has DNA. And that DNA uh, serves as the hereditary blueprint for us. Um, so your dog, your fish, the tree outside, they all have DNA. The amazing thing is that lots of those genes are conserved. Right? A tree has to break down the own, its own sugars that it makes. Your dog has to break down sugars. And so those genes are pretty much the same in humans and dogs and fish, et cetera. Um, but some of them are different. And those differences uh, make us wonderfully unique and make you a unique person. This is called a karyotype. It's a stain of the chromosomes when they're getting ready to divide in cells when the DNA is condensed. Right? DNA kind of looks like a spaghetti in a bowl in the nucleus of a cell, but then during division, it gets condensed into these chromosomes. And so here you can see that this would be a boy because it's 23 pairs of chromosomes, and then the sex chromosomes are an X and a Y. And we'll learn more about that. It's always a favorite uh, unit of uh, study for students, and I'm really excited about some of the activities we'll do this year. Okay, every living thing is composed of cells. So a cell is the smallest thing that can be alive on its own. A prokaryotic cell is a bacterial cell, and this would be the smallest, uh, simplest living thing. But like I said in class, right, bacteria have been around a lot longer before humans came around, and they'll be here afterwards. So don't sleep on bacteria, and you have more bacteria in your mouth than there are people in the world. Um, and then, so inside of us, we have bacteria and they help us out a lot. And we also are made of eukaryotic cells. And these cells um, evolve from bacterial cells. And some of them, like the mitochondria, is a remnant of bacteria that uh, coexisted in cells for a long time. And these eukaryotic cells are going to provide the basis for our life, right? They're going to have the DNA inside this nucleus, which is going to be able to code for uh, RNA, which is going to be able to code for proteins. And those proteins go out and do work in our body. All right, that was a little more detail than you needed to know or needed to think about. Homeostasis, so we went over this in class. Hopefully you remember. Homeo, uh, similar to or keeping the same and stasis standing still. So trying to keep something the same in our body. For example, a similar body temperature. So if we get too hot, we sweat so that we can cool down. If we get too cold, we shiver so that we can warm up. I know it's hard to keep the temperature uh, the same in our room, so you might do some shivering and some sweating in here. Can you give some other good examples of items that we would need to regulate in our bodies? All right. Hopefully you got something maybe like glucose. So diabetics have problems with that, with uh, insulin levels. Um, 
And then maybe uh, you got something like blood pH. We went over that in class with Dr. Cannon, or uh, you might have gotten um, calcium levels, and so building bones, et cetera. All right, everything has to depend upon other things. That's what interdependence means. Even a bacterium that can just exist on its own still has to interact with its environment and get food from its environment, right? And so you can probably think about it in the context of food chains and food webs. Everything eats something else or lives in an environment with other things. And so it's a big theme in biology is interdependence among organisms. Here's the trickiest one. We will spend a whole unit on evolution, but evolution only happens in the population. It does not happen on an individual level. You are born with what you got and you will either uh, reproduce and pass on those genes or not. And, but in a population, there can be selection for certain uh, characteristics. For example, these are the rock pocket mice that we'll study. And there were lava flows in the Southwestern United States. And those who had, you know, dark coats would blend in with the lava flows and those with the light coats wouldn't. Um, so if there's a lava flow, the black coats would be selected for and they would be the ones that would uh, be more likely to survive and reproduce and pass on those genes. So we think of evolution as a characteristic of life, but it can only happen on a population uh, in within a population. It can happen on an individual scale. So it's a tricky one. You don't need to memorize or know that for a test. We'll go over it a lot more. Um, and then it's always tied to genetics, right? We, we, what gives us these different phenotypes or these different physical traits would be genes. And so this is a gene that we have as humans as well, MC1R, and there were mutations in it. So the, the mice were light colored originally, and then there was a lava flow and there was a random mutation and that's what made them dark. So mutation is random, whereas selection is not. So there will always be random mutations in a population, but then uh, the environment will select the winners and losers. Okay, those are the characteristics of life. That was um, probably more time than we needed to spend on that. Um, we'll get into ecology here. So if you're watching this video, I'm, I'm posting it about a week and a half or two weeks before the test, we haven't gone over a couple of these things like water cycle, carbon cycle, nitrogen cycle, et cetera. We'll get there. And if I have to cut some stuff from the test, we will. Um, but I do need to keep it on the 30th and uh, the 29th, I believe, um, just to have fidelity with your other classes and to get us ready before the high school uh, assessment, or excuse me, student assessment window. So can you give a basic overview of the water cycle, carbon cycle, and nitrogen cycle? And with these, I really emphasize the human effects on them, right? What are we as humans doing? To them? So here's the water cycle that we will go over in class, or if you're watching this video later that we have gone over, and we'll take out the water models, the little magnetic ones, and I'll make some jokes about spilling water on the floor. And um, the big one I had you model is transpiration. Right? And so water is a polar molecule. It has the oxygen is negative. You can think about it like Mickey Mouse. So a negative chin and happy ears. So the ears or the hydrogens are positive. That's just because oxygen is a bigger element. It's more what we call electronegative. So the oxygens being negative and the uh, hydrogens being positive make for a polar molecule. And water molecules can bond to each other. The positive hydrogen, the Mickey Mouse ears, can, will be attracted to the negative oxygen of another water molecule. That is called a hydrogen bond. Because of that, in plants and in trees, as water exits the leaf, so if there's holes on the other side of the leaf, and we'll do this with some of the plants in class, we'll look at the stomata, water evaporates out of the leaf, the next water molecule is pulled up the chain through the, uh, the xylem in the, the plant. So just think about it this way. If there's tubes running up a plant, water literally gets pulled up as each water molecule evaporates. That's why if trees get air bubbles in them called cavitation, that can be a big problem. So what are some uh, human effects on the water cycle? Well, down here you can see groundwater. And while you don't need to memorize the word percolation or infiltration, et cetera, 
you can know that we have uh, big aquifers. And these aquifers or these groundwater sources are where we put wells. And at those wells, we get water to drink. And the problem is, is that we're draining the aquifers faster than they can be refreshed by natural processes. So you can see the problem in and of itself there. Um, we're also draining lakes and rivers, right, for drinking water. And so um, rivers aren't reaching the ocean with the same amount of water or frequency that they used to. And so we are using fresh water up and there's a lot more salt water and non-usable water uh, than fresh water available to us. And so there could be big problems with this. And we call that the diamond water paradox. You know, how much do you pay for diamonds to impress somebody, but how much do you need water? And what's going to be worth more in the future? All right, so water scarcity is a big thing to think about. Okay, the carbon cycle. So we're going to go in depth into the carbon cycle in our next unit. We're gonna think about an inorganic carbon cycle, which would be from uh, volcanoes emitting carbon dioxide and an organic one thinking about um, us as uh, living organisms. What do we breathe out? We breathe out CO2. So carbon gets into the air and that carbon in the air, uh, if you know anything about uh, global warming, creates the greenhouse effect and is what warms us up. Um, that carbon can be absorbed by trees um, or it could dissolve in the oceans. And so when it's absorbed by trees, the trees and the plants make uh, glucose with it. So, and they're going to give off oxygen, which is what we uh, breathe and what we enjoy. And so it's kind of the cycle of life. So cellular respiration is the production of carbon dioxide when we're making energy and photosynthesis is the use of carbon dioxide to make glucose. Here is, this is from Khan Academy, just showing uh, CO2 levels fluctuating over the years. So you can see that there's been uh, differing concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere and this coincides with uh, the ice ages and uh, points on earth when it's been a lot warmer. And so here you can see an anomaly and the anomaly is uh, from the 1950s onwards in uh, the world, we have a lot higher CO2 levels and that's because of industrialization and factories and pollution. And so it's measured, um, you can tell, look, it's a pretty fresh reading, right? Um, from the, what's called the Keeling curve from an observatory in Hawaii. And so it's showing that we're over 400 parts per million. And so it'll be interesting for you to see where we're at, you know, when you graduate high school, when you graduate university, and what are we doing as a collective earth to try and lessen the amount of carbon dioxide in the air? Okay, the nitrogen cycle, this one can look scary. It's got um, uh, ions and chemicals in it, et cetera. So I don't really want you to worry too much about that. Just know that we need nitrogen fixing bacteria to make nitrogen usable by plants. And then that nitrogen that's usable by plants, we eat plants and we need nitrogen students to make two things. We need nitrogen to make DNA. DNA is full of nitrogenous bases and we need nitrogen to make proteins. Nitrogen is a key element within proteins. And so we'll go over that more later on in the course. Um, but what's interesting here, the human effect, is that we are putting down massive amounts of nitrogen fertilizers. And those fertilizers contain nitrogen and phosphorus, and they are often limiting nutrients in a system. And so can you talk about what is a limiting nutrient and what are some of those implications for fertilizer runoff, the streams, lakes, and the ocean? All right. A limiting nutrient is... Uh, just like it says, it's what's limiting population growth in an area. So if all of a sudden there's nitrogen in the system, let's say, for example, in the seawater around Oman, because it's been dumped in by fertilizers, then plants or algae can start to grow a lot more because they have nitrogen to make DNA and to make their proteins. Beforehand, it might not be abundant in the system. And if they can't make DNA, they can't divide, they can't make more algae. So if you have this fertilizer runoff in the streams, lakes, and the ocean, you get what are called these HABs, these harmful algae blooms. 
And those harmful algae blooms make the water look yucky, they make it look green. And it can be even worse in that they can choke out the sunlight from getting down so it can kill plants, which is gonna decrease the amount of oxygen in the water, right? Oxygen, when fish breathe in the water, they're not breaking apart H2O molecules, they're breathing dissolved oxygen within the water. And if there's no dissolved oxygen, or if it's all gone because all the plants are gone, then they die and you get those fish kills. Um, and you might think, well, isn't the algae providing water? Well, the algae is dying very quickly and it's consumed by bacteria and that bacteria is using up all the oxygen in the water as well. And that's what's called, uh, creates hypoxic or low oxygen level in uh, streams, lakes, and the ocean. Here's an example. Um, this whole process has a name and that name is called eutrophication. So as um, here, a bunch of fertilizer got into this lake. Here comes this algae bloom. It's going to choke out the sunlight and kill the plants below. All right. This we have gone over, so hopefully it should look familiar. You've done it a couple of times. You did it on the, the black lab tables and you, you draped strings, et cetera. So can you describe these, a food chain, food web, the energy transfers? What are some of the implications of your findings? All right, so hopefully you got, here's an example of a food chain, a producer being eaten by a consumer, eaten by another consumer, and eaten by a tertiary consumer. When you combine multiple food chains together, you get food webs like this. All right, and so um, I asked you about how much energy is passed on to each level, and I think you all probably nailed it. Right? It's about 10%. It can be more or less. I gave you a pretty complicated homework assignment about that, a Pogel on energy transfer. Did you start it in class? Um, but hopefully you could see the purpose of the model, just to see that energy is lost as heat each time it is passed along. So when the, the mice eat the grass, or let's say the mollusks eat this uh, plankton, they're going to use some of that energy to grow and do other stuff and they're gonna lo lose some of it. When this fish eats the mollusk, it's going to lose some of the, or it's gonna use some of the energy to move around and it's gonna lose it as well. So this has some pretty big implications, right? It takes a lot of energy to grow animals to eat. Do you think the world could be a better place if we didn't grow animals to eat them, but if instead we ate vegetables, um, which we can get perfectly enough the amount of proteins that we need to do. All right, so here is the caterpillar that I showed you up there. So only about 10% is passed on. The part that's passed on is called biomass, right? It's gonna be the fat or the muscles of the organism that can be eaten. The things that can't be passed on are that heat that escapes and that heat is a byproduct of cellular respiration or which is making energy for the caterpillar to move around or poop, right? And the poop doesn't get passed on. Um, somebody brought up in class, it's a good point that the poop is eaten by other organisms and that does start the brown food web. So should you be a vegetarian? Think about it. All right. Can you describe the brown food web and how it's connected to a green food web? We watched a Ted Ed video on this in class. Once again, if you're seeing this early, we might not have yet. And here, this is straight from the Ted Ed video, but it's showing the poop or the dead things and what eats them and it can start another eco, another food web, right? We kind of learn in, in grade school that a food web always starts with a green thing and it goes from the grass to the mouse to the snake or it goes from the grass to the grasshopper to the coyote. But things eat dead things as well, right? So mushrooms grow on dead stuff or poop and then a mouse can eat the mushroom and a snake can eat the mouse, right? And so it can get back to us as well. So it's just important that we have decomposers and things that eat uh, dead stuff. Otherwise, the world will be full of dead things. Okay, so here's one of our first lessons where we really got into the nature science. Can you describe a trophic cascade? Um, I have this activity up in Google Classroom. You can go back through it. You took the cards, uh, you arranged them by color or by habitat, and you thought about um, what would happen. So try these two. Can you describe them? All right, so let's see if you got them. Here, the sea otter eats the urchins. So that's gonna make the number of urchins go down. 
urchins eat kelp. That makes the number of kelp go down. So the presence of sea otters actually helps the kelp because the sea otters reduce the number of urchins, which makes lets the kelp grow. And you saw in areas that had sea otters removed, the kelp was gone, right? And then they were covered with urchins. And you can see it in this picture right here. With sea otters, you got a lot of kelp. Without them, you don't. So over here, this is an interesting one, right? This fish is eating this fish. This fish can eat the Daphnia. The Daphnia eat uh, these guys. And so it's going to be negative, negative, negative. So the big fish actually hurt these ones because this would go down. These would go up in number and these would go down. And so this is called a trophic cascade. So what does it mean? A trophic level is a level in an, a food pyramid or an energy pyramid. So, right, you could have producers, primary consumers, secondary consumers, tertiary consumers, producers, primary consumers, secondary consumers. This would be the tertiary consumer. So an effect or a change in one of those levels can impact multiple levels away from it. That's the trophic cascade. So cascades like dominoes falling down or affecting multiple levels. Okay. Can you compare and contrast exponential growth and logistic growth? So we went over this in class and then you did a pogo on it. Um, can an elephant show exponential growth? And the answer is absolutely, right? So everything grows exponentially, that J-shaped curve. It is only due to a limiting factor, like the amounts of food, available space, um, maybe disease, et cetera, that we stop growing exponentially and we reach what's called a carrying capacity. The carrying capacity is the maximum number of individuals that can be supported by a given area. So for example, it might be that the elephants in the Serengeti can only be at this number. The, sh the thing to remember is that carrying capacity is not set. It's not set in stone. It can go down. If we burn the Amazon, then the carrying capacity, because the amount of land has decreased, is going to go down for all species there. So it's really sad. So think about what climate change is doing to affect carrying capacities for individuals. So one more time, carrying capacity is the maximum number of individuals of a species that can be supported by a given area. So can you compare and contrast R and K selected species? Right, so we went over this in class. This is just a way that as ecologists, we can group species. Uh, it's helpful to talk about when we talk about their evolutionary adaptations uh, for success and to continue to keep their species around. So K-selected species would be like us, like humans, right? We have a long life. Um, it takes a while before we're able to reproduce. We have very few reproductive events and few offspring, but we give a lot of energy into them to grow them up and so that they can carry on our species and carry on our genetic code. Our selected species, named so for uh, the, the equation for population biology that gets into it, um, have relatively short lives and they are able to reproduce pretty quickly. And then they have tons of reproductive events and tons of offspring. So if you saw the video I showed you with the uh, Asian carp and that invasive species, they had 2 million baby fish. That's insane. Or think about fruit flies and fruit flies can have lots of babies as well. So see if you can come up with some extra examples of K and R species. Okay, can you describe density dependent and density independent factors that affect growth of populations? So it's just like the name sounds, density dependent depends upon the density of the population. Density is how many individuals there are in an area. So if it becomes too crowded, there can be disease, there can be competition for resources, there can be a lack of food or water or space, um, there can be predation uh, amongst them. And so I gave you the example of the uh, fungal disease that's affecting bats when I showed you the video from Dr. Frick. Density independent are things that are outside that don't uh, aren't correlated with or aren't caused by the number of individuals in the population. For example, if a hurricane comes and wipes out a bunch of lizards, that is due to, you know, an act of weather. It's density independent. 
Um, some other examples could be habitat destruction, or um, I showed you the example of the Asian carp, right? It didn't, it was independent of the other organisms, but then they're going to reap, the carp are going to replace the other fish because they're able to reproduce faster and take up, uh, they're not going to have predators in those rivers. Okay. What's a niche or niche? Either way to pronounce it is fine. And can you describe the competitive exclusion principle? All right, a niche is the e ecological role or way of life for organisms. It's def defined by the full set of conditions, resources, and interactions it needs or can make use of. So in class, I said it's like I asked you to come up with it. Then I said it's like your job, your habitat, and what you eat. Right. So what do you do? Where do you live? What do you eat? And it is define your niche. So your niche during the school day is to be a, a biology student here at Taysom High School and to eat whatever you bring for lunch in the high school commons. Right? So if two species try and occupy the exact same niche, what's going to happen? They're going to fight. Right? And there's going to be competitive exclusion. They cannot occupy the exact same niche. So you went through a simulation on uh, with a virtual lab, and I was really proud of the graphs that you drew out of that. And these are dealing with paramecium. And it's paramecium aurelia and caudatum. Um, and what's interesting about this is that caudatum is actually a little bit bigger than aurelia. But when you grow them together, you see that aurelia does fine and caudatum dies off, if you can move my head there. Um, and it's pretty interesting, right? So they have been, it's an example of the competitive exclusion principle by the ecologist Gregory Gauss. So look at them when they're each grown alone, they each show that exponential growth curve. They can each grow uh, to their carrying capacity in the flask or petri dish. But when grown together, um, Aurelia is going to win and Caudatum is going to lose. So this I really glanced over in class, but just know that you have um, factors that affect your niche. So you might prefer to be, you know, uh, right here at Tazem, but if you, if, you know, if, if you are undergoing stress, et cetera, um, or if Tazem, uh, you know, had like a water leak or something close for a day, we could go learn somewhere else. It just might not be optimum for us. Um, so you can think about this for fish, right? What's going to happen to their range of tolerance as the ocean keeps getting acidified? So here you're seeing there's an optimum range that the organism likes, but there's a zone of tolerance that the organism can live in, but it's not as good. And then there's areas that we can't live at all, right? So it'd be really hard for us to live out in uh, um, the Antarctic or the Arctic, right? We're not uh, prepared unless we have lots of food with us and um, really warm clothes to be able to make it. So d don't worry about that one as much. We just didn't quite really get into that. This was pretty cool. We did an HHMI activity with this one. Can you describe niche partitioning or niche partitioning? So we just said that P. Aurelia and P. Caudatum are going to fight each other. They're going to competitively exclude each other. But how do organisms live in the same area, right? You see all these antelope in the same area. You see lots of fish in the same area. So wouldn't that be a violation of the competitive exclusion principle? And it's not. And it's not because they partition or they set up dividers between them. And so these dividers can be in space. Here's an example of um, dividing up an area by space. Or it could be in when they eat. It could be in time. It could be um, one organism is active at night and the other organism is active during the day. And so as long as their niche is partitioned somehow, they don't have to fight. And if they don't have to fight, they can both use that area. This one was a really cool example. It was showing uh, the grass. So after a big rain in the Serengeti and the zebras would come along and kind of eat the uh, top parts of it and mow it down a little bit. And then the wildebeest would come along and then the gazelles would eat the final parts. And it's just showing that they can all be in the same area because they're eating at different times. And so they're not in, they're not uh, engaging in competitive exclusion because they have slightly different niches due to partition. 
Um, here is a fundamental niche versus a realized niche. And so this was, I believe, in your chapter three to six selected reading questions, which uh, many of you all loved. And so here, this is a barnacle called Cathalamus. And then here's one called Semibalanus. So Semibalanus is slightly bigger. Cathalamus can live in this whole area and it's happy to. But when Semibalanus is around, Semibalanus is bigger and lives there. And Cathalamus's niche gets squeezed to this area right here. So the big area is called the fundamental niche. It's where you could go, where you could live. But your realized niche is where you're squeezed into. So the example I'll use in class is your fundamental niche is that you could be a student uh, anywhere in Muscat, in any high school in Muscat, Oman. But your realized niche is because you've chosen to go to Taysom is right here at Taysom. So you are a student here at the American International School of Muscat. All right. Can you compare and contrast primary and secondary succession? So for this one, we'll go over this more later on, but it's just interesting when new land is formed, like a, an island is made or bare rock is exposed, there's going to be, you know, the evolution of there's going to be some small plants. And then as they die, it's going to build up the soil and you'll get slightly bigger ones. Um, and it could go on um, and it could look different in different ecosystems. Um, secondary succession is just like when there's a wildfire or something that clears out an area and then there's going to be intense competition to colonize that land. Um, it's pretty cool. Uh, we looked at um, there's a, a fun AP problem that we that my students have done in the past on this that we can check out later on. But not a lot to memorize here, just except that you know there is some type of succession, and when it's wide open like this, there's pretty intense competition to to take over those open niches. And those open niches are taken over in a process that's called adaptive radiation. We'll go through that later on in our evolution unit. Okay, this should be pretty easy. Can we give an example of each of these ecological relationships? So hopefully a parasite, it could be like ticks eating your blood. Um, mutualism, we all learn from each other. We all help each other in this class. Commensalism is the one we see the least in nature. So the barnacle benefits while the whale does not care. Um, and predation would be like uh, wolves hunting elk. And so you looked at this through, um, we showed the video in class, the uh, Canadian lynx going after the snowshoe hare and the boom and bust cycles of their predator prey relationship. Okay, why should pregnant women not consume sushi? And so can you explain biomagnification? So we'll model this in class with um, some little dots and cutouts. So as Rachel Carson famously showed in Silent Spring, that if you put pollution down, well, it can then be absorbed by these producers and it will then get eaten by a primary consumer and then by small fish and then by large fish and then into the birds. Well, it keeps getting concentrated as it goes up the system because the poison can't be processed. So if it gets into your fatty tissues, the poison can't be metabolized. So it's just building up. So we'll model this by putting dots on the little fish. And so... If the little fish get eaten by the big fish, well, let's say the big fish ate 20 little fish, right, over, you know, the course of a couple months. It would have 20 dots in it. Well, then the eagle up here is going to eat five fish that have each have 20 dots in it. So the eagle is going to accumulate 100 dots in it. And so that's why she said it would be a silent spring because the spraying of poison would eventually get up and kill all the birds or you wouldn't have the bird songs in the spring. Okay, this is another TED talk, uh, TED Ed, excuse me. Can you describe ecosystem diversity, species diversity, and genetic diversity, and how can you help promote them? Well, hopefully you got it. It's just like the name sounds. Ecosystem is the variety of ecosystems within a given region. Species would be the number of different species in a given ecosystem. And genetic diversity would be the variety of genes within a given species, right? So... We, we would want to see lots of different um, lions in a savanna or lots of different turtles because otherwise they might experience a genetic bottleneck, right, where they're all too closely related and it would result in inbreeding. Species diversity, a uh, good example of this would be the uh, starfish experiment that we saw with Robert Payne. And ecosystem diversity, 
Um, this is a little harder to think about, but how many different ecosystems are, uh, are within a biome or within a country, right? So, and it kind of goes from big to small. And that's it. All right, students, uh, good luck studying for this test. I will be after school some next week to help you with it. Um, and I'll give you the study guide, et cetera. And remember, it's all about the process. It's all about making those connections and really engaging and mastering the material. Take care and good luck.